Hello everyone and welcome to Fraktios Peratipresis. Uh, today we are going to hear about the digitalization of healthcare by Tanya. Give her a warm welcome to her. Thank you so much. Hello everyone and also everyone following us live. Um, I hope that this presentation Ooh. is going to be more like a conversation than, than a lecture from me. So please just shout out your questions or comments and let's begin. So today's agenda is has something to do with this picture over here. So I would like to uh, present my latest project and also maybe teach you a thing or two about my field and uh, ECMOS. So I'll start with introducing myself and my story begins in faraway land in Croatia. So this is a city I was born in, Nin, 94. Uh, my parents have always told me that living there was peaceful, average. It's a shame I never had the chance to witness this because in 95, when I was uh, six months old, perhaps we were forced to leave our, our home, all of us Serbs in Croatia. So something called cleanse happened and we were forced to leave our We homes. were we forced to leave Serbia. our, where I grew up, I lived all of my childhood in, in this small refugee center type of solution but everything turned out all right I think my parents worked very hard for us and especially my mom who is sitting there um, really uh, wanted better future for her children me and my brother so we ended up here most innovative country, the second most, uh, greenest country, highest qu quality of life country. So yeah, this is Finland in numbers, I think. Um, this is my home, yes. And I've had some amazing opportunities here and I took them, so let's begin. Um, I have done and tried a few things in my life. Uh, some of them didn't stick around, some of them did. Some of my interests became my profession and as you can see uh, there's a lot of bit of art and experimenting, even live streaming, <laughs> cheerleading. So. I had the privilege to try a thing or two before I found what's really uh, for me. And of course, I learned a lot of things in in life and in through work and uh, especially through art. It's funny. Uh, for example, this picture has been following me for a very long time and somehow I always come back to it when I encounter some problems or change in my life. Uh, and also this picture represents what I think about different interest, interest, interests and, and uh, yeah, so lessons learned to this day, of course, about creativity and this inspiration, it comes and goes. So go with the flow and try to catch it when you can. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, about collect collective thinking, also here in Fraktio. And uh, yeah, I've, I try to question a lot in and in business and in life. So let's get to the good part 
uh, I would like to start with brains. So, if you have one, this concerns you. So yeah, this is where what really started my passion for medical devices. So, what is this? Anybody? Brain implants. Yeah. Electrodes. Brain implant in brain, not implanted brain. Anything else? No? Well, yeah, this is a CT scan of a uh, head. And what we can see is some wiring pointing to some place. But actually, this is a DBS system. And what it does, it sends small electric pulses to uh, one small part of the brain. It sounds pretty simple, but what it does, it really change, changes people's lives in front of you when you see it. So that was so amazing experience to see for me. Uh, patients with um, Parkinson's, with different diseases, neurological diseases, um, have found this uh, very effective for them. So basically when I worked as a nurse in neurosurgery department, I had the chance to witness this, uh, this amazing collaboration of technology, IT, medicine, and, and just seeing what it can do to people. It was very beautiful. Uh, I had these patients that came to the surgery um, in very bad condition, very sick. And then after a few days when the doctor turns this on, you can see just everything changing in them. Their big uh, symptoms just start to calm. And that's, that's what really got me thinking that, that I want to do this. So yeah, this is a picture of the surgery procedure where the surgeon is implementing DBS electrodes to this patient's brain. So yeah, tech is kind of great and medicine too. The patient is playing a violin at the same time. So the surgeon can, and the crew can um, see that the electrodes don't affect the patient's ability to play music, for example, or, or other guy was singing opera in his operation. So yeah, it, it is, very inspiring to see something us nerds can make and then what it does to someone, in my opinion. So this is another example of uh, the same kind of technology. So this is a nerve stimulator, uh, people with very serious chronic pain. If you can imagine waking up in terrible pain and living through it every single day and have to use tons of medication. And then if obviously it doesn't work for everyone, but this little implant can change that in seconds. That, that terrible thing that, um, takes up your whole life. So yeah, this was very inspiring for me to see in neurosurgery. Um, then I transferred to heart surgery department, which was very good choice because I had the chance to see um, even more even more uh, amazing examples of technology and medicine together. This is one of them. This is 
ventricular uh, assist machine, and that's a uh, heart. So obviously it does something to help the heart pump blood forward. Uh, I, can I could talk about this all day, so let's not get into it uh, that much. But yeah, this, even though I didn't know exactly what I want to do, what, what was that one area of medicine or technology, but I found myself surrounded by these very inspiring devices and uh, I had the chance as a nurse to witness them in use in patients and see how they affect their lives. Okay, so that was uh, pretty small stuff. This is a little bit bigger. Uh, this is a, a kind of old and not so great picture of open heart surgery. And this little thing here is heart lung machine. So basically when the surgeon is operating uh, the heart, uh, in most cases, is, it, it has to be stopped, so the heart stops beating. And then, of course, you have to have something keeping the person alive, and, and that's tech, basically. So there is uh, a lot of stuff happening here, which I could also talk about all day, but um, yeah, it's very complicated system and and it's crucial for heart surgery. This is a simplified version of it. You can probably understand what happens. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the part where I found what I was supposed to do. So this is a modified version of that big heart lung system. This is called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenator system. And this picture was taken about a year ago in ECMO Center Karolinska, where I was visiting for a week. So uh, do you see the patient here? Something, yeah. This is the head of the two week old baby. So she is the patient in this picture. This is the ECMO system, and this is basically what is keeping her alive. Um, again, a simplified picture of the circulation, the components, what it consists of. Uh, basically, there are two types of ECMOs. I'm focusing on the one what is used mostly for lung disorders. So very serious uh, lung sickness or, or trauma or a situation that your lungs and body cannot uh, perform oxy oxygen gas ex exchange. So uh, ECMO is probably one of the last last things you uh, turn to in this situation. It's very complicated. It's very uh, particular. It uh, needs to be handled by professionals. So in Karolinska University Hospital, they have this ECMO center where all the doctors and nurses are specialized in this treatment. And I got the chance to visit them, uh, even go on a few trips with them to get uh, retrieve a patient and uh, it, it was really amazing. I'll show you some pictures, but um, 
the thing that attracted me was not the actual device, even though it needs a lot of uh, work still, but the, the system of that center was very fascinating. So if you imagine all of this, this is the ECMO system, and then we have all these devices keeping the patient alive, which is here, by the way. Um, it's a lot. But what happens when you have to transfer the patient with all of that stuff? What happens when you have to retrieve the patient from somewhere else or, or uh, transfer from hospital to another. It's a very big complicated task. Even inside the hospital, it takes a lot of people, a lot of equipment uh, and time to um, move the patient around. So obviously it has a lot of risk. It has a lot of um, things to consider and obviously these people are very well trained, but they seem to need some kind of system, some kind of uh, helper, uh, tool, guide to um, simplify this or, or work as a, as a tool for them. That's why I was so interested to inco incorporate tech with this and mostly IT. Uh, because I had this, I had this picture of an app that could really help solve a lot of things. So um, yeah, this team uh, goes to different hospitals in Sweden or around the world to put patients on ECMO treatments because they are specialists. So they have to bring along everything that's necessary, bags, systems, surgery equipment. Uh, they need to be self-sufficient because you can't just rely on the fact that somebody maybe has the right stuff. So that's the problem or issue number one. You have to get every single thing with you and you have to somehow um, coordinate it all. So uh, they use pre-packed bags, everything is checked, everything is pre-packed, but when the situation hits you, obviously that's a, that's a very stressful situation and has a lot to just to do with relying on someone's memory or, or or ability to check that everything is uh, took. So this is uh, this is actually what it takes to uh, go and put the patient on ECMO and and uh, retrieve him or her back to the hospital. So that that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of heavy stuff that needs appropriate uh, uh, transportation, not to mention if you're traveling by air, airplane or... Yes, please. Uh, that looks like a lot uh, amount of uh, stuff, but still not as much that they're wearing the hospital. So is this some kind of like uh, intermediate device that you just use to uh, move the patient or is this actually the whole thing but somehow in smaller form? Good question. So the ECMO system, uh, it's about here. Uh, everything else you see are, this is a different device that uh, works in different, uh, in different biological areas, areas in the body. So this one is not, uh, incorporated with the ECMO system so it's manageable to leave it for the transport and also when you get the patient put it uh, on ECMO and come back then you can start this other treatment of course there are drugs 
and other devices that has to come along on the transportation. But yeah, I'll show you um, also a picture of that to demonstrate. So yeah, a lot of uh, logistic issues, a lot of uh, remembering, a lot of checking, double checking, uh, not to mention the changing plans. You have to consider everything, the weather, the schedule, the country you're going to. You have to rely on people to know what is happening, what they have to expect from the team. Um, a lot of variables. So yeah, in Sweden they have this modified I think it was a uh, yeah, library truck or bus that is modified for an ambulance uh, for ECMO patients mainly. So yeah, we traveled to this particular hospital to retrieve a patient which was already on ECMO, but uh, because the ECMO Center has the appropriate speciality and, and equipment. The patient was transferred to Karolinska. So as you can see, uh, we have the patient, the ECMO monitors, drugs, equipment. You have to make sure that everything stays put. At the same time, you have to uh, keep up with the patient, take samples, take measurements. Uh, it's, it's very a lot of work. So yeah, um, we'll come back to my solution or tool for these transports, how I think I could help and how I think what kind of tools we need in hospitals, in ambulances. But then to the fun part, digitalization, yay! Why are you not cheering? <laughs> so yeah, this is, the, uh, this is the best explanation or quote I could find. I read some very uh, good studies and stuff, but Wikipedia was just the best one. So the process of converting information to a digital format. Okay, if that's digitalization, then we've done it already. What's, what's next? We have, we have uh, patient uh, programs and, and... Okay, the data is converted. So, what's next? Um, there was this study. Uh, very uh, big study made by Finnish Institute of Health and Welfare about digitalization in healthcare. And uh, well, it didn't come as a surprise to notice uh, which type of people were uh, maybe excluded from the service. So elderly people, even young people who are just not interested in using government service, which were found uh, not, not sufficient. Um, yeah, even farmers, for some reason, were actually studied to be excluded from digitalized uh, services, and uh, low educated people. So yeah, basically we're screwed. Um, I don't have a solution for you or, or I can tell you now what should we do differently. I have studied this, I have read about it, I have used these uh, programs as a professional and as a consumer and there are some points that um, I feel that that we need to uh, make better. So
So yeah, if we think about national health and welfare and digitalization of that area, what do you think of? Is it efficient? Do you feel like if you, if you go through some difficult times and need Kela services or, or social services, is it easy to find information to use, to log on to your personal um, data? No? Yeah, I guess like our external reasons, like if you look at the statement here, yeah. it's like pointing your finger on someone else. Like, you're not good enough to use this. Mm. And the last one is the thing like, oh, well, and then there's the part that people want internet service. Mm. Maybe that's something, I guess, uh, we're luckily uh, waking up to, that okay, yes. these services are not something that you can replace everything with. Yeah, I agree. and. Uh, what I noticed is that uh, companies that design these uh, services and programs, I don't, this is my personal opinion, but I don't know how into this they are, how much they understand the uh, latest tech, the the studies about design, the user experience, or is it just something so big that it's hard to uh, change? But yeah, we can see a lot of um, a lot of change in opinions about these digital services, and and people have woken up to this. If we think about all the changes happening in Finland, everything is so in our social and health services, it, it's changing. But mostly this is, this is the, the profound um, statement about our e-services digitalization. So yeah, basically we've done that. We've turned information into digitals, zeros and ones. Okay, but everything else is lacking. Uh, I've seen it a lot of times in my work in hospitals, for example, using uh, different kind of patient monitoring systems or, or just uh, software. It's very complicated. It's not making my work any easier. It's not making my work any faster, efficient. Of course, we have to store the data and have a place to put it. And no, I don't want any paper anymore, uh, pa patient files. But we have to definitely improve it and make it more please. User friendly, thank you. Engineer, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, these are the things that I found in researches online, asking people uh, using my own experiences, what is wrong today with our attempt to digitalize healthcare. Uh, does anything come to you as a surprise? Maybe? No? Yeah, same, same questions, same topics. Uh, but then looking at these problems, so-called issues, they, they, uh, they can be seen also, they should be seen um, as a challenge. So security. Of course, you can hack anything, but do you see the kind of the challenge in there as a nation who leads the IT world? That's written all over. I don't know by who, but is it really um, that impossible to make a working 
e-system for our services when they there are so many enormous websites, enormous, enormous uh, let's say, let's say Amazon or Google, they have tremendous amount of data, of data storage, of uh, how can they do it, do it and not us? Should we think more like corporates? Should we think more um, like, I don't know, I don't have an answer for you. Do you have any thoughts? I have an idea because uh, actually when we go into more deep in the medical device regulation that is coming actually in the spring 2020, so the software will be included in that. Oh. So that, that's an enormous amount of money that you need to be putting on the table. The notified bodies will be less in the European <coughs> area and, and, and getting a device to be sold in healthcare or used in healthcare can mm. pay 17.5 million euros to yes. get the license for a software mm. to be sold all over, all over in Europe. So that's a huge amount of money. Who is investing that money that you get good design, user experience, and it's safety for the patient yes. also. So I think that the regulation is so tight and actually it tries to be for helping us that the professionals in healthcare, they use just those methodologies that are proven Mm. But it's it's very expensive. Yes, of course. So yes, this is a, a big question. Where does the money came, come from? But also let me ask you, uh, in the current situation, we are provided with almost all of our government services and health services from a few companies, usually American companies or or so if you think those companies which have all of our information data and, and uh, provide us with services, and then can, couldn't we really um, build a system which is based on open source that's free? You don't have to pay some uh, American engineer to make you a system when you have all these guys here which are uh, professional in what they do and they use open source for example. So uh, I know for a fact that companies that provide us with medical um, programs they are not collective. That they all that they um, all of them their um, programs are strictly st just stored somewhere behind these middle doors and and there is no no uh, coder thinking in my opinion so why not more web services? Why not more um, open source, more uh, conversation between different kind of companies? Why do we have to buy from a one company who provides us with patient systems, for example? Uh, is Apotti familiar for anyone? Yeah. How many billions? millions did we used on that a lot yeah so basically that's a program bought from American company and then it's modified integrated to Finnish systems but are, aren't we just trying to uh, sell Finnish IT experience experiment to other countries and our services and our companies and then we go and buy. So we have to step up, do something ourselves, in my opinion, in, in things that I've read. So um, 
I would like to uh, continue with this topic in the future and, and try to figure out what's the appropriate amount of open source and startups to build up something bigger, something distributed, something with more components than just buy this one service from this one company that takes a lot of money. And yeah, Th there's a pickle for you, sorry. Okay, so uh, that's the fun stuff. Let's get back to ECMO. But first, I will would like to show you a few things. This is um, a tax service. Where is English? Too close. Okay. So this is our tax service, e-service. I think it's pretty good. Don't you think it's pretty good? It has a big search bar. That's, I can just like, find what I need. Does anybody anymore actually browse through the website infos and questions and no, this, I don't know who has been doing these sites, but I think it's pretty okay. So next, uh, Conta service. And look at this. Yes. Go Kella. I mean, yeah. They're getting it. They're using more open source, more um, distributed um, services compared to this one big company. All right, so back to my stuff, tech. This is a very early version of my program step. This is the desktop version. Uh, they, there is a mobile version, but I'll introduce it to you quickly. So this is for uh, designed with for the ECMO teams uh, with analyzing their uh, their schedules, their um, work, what they do, what they need, what they don't need in a program, a lot of that. So yeah, I came up with this kind of solution. Uh, obviously, it's under construction, but yeah, I really try to start from the bottom with whys and hows instead of thinking about uh, all the components that need to be done and, and stuff like that. So yeah, this is um, what I came with, up with so far. It has all of the needed structures and of course there will be uh, a lot of other things. For example, this is a checklist. So they can make sure that they, they take everything. It's, it's very simple, actually, if, if you forget something, it just doesn't let you pass. Of course it does, but it, it, it forms you. So nothing, I didn't invent anything new. I just listened to them, I analyzed their work, and I try, tried to make some kind of structure that work. Uh, next things, maybe some kind of audio control system, some kind of automated um, system, of course, 
artificial intelligence at some point, everything. So, yes. I'm looking forward to get the chance to test this in ECMO centers and continue study and continue to uh, drive these optimized products for uh, health services instead of big, big junk of software. Um, yeah, ask me, ask stuff, not about the code, because this is uh, made with Wix. Yeah, JavaScript and Wix combined. It's not a act of profession. But yeah, this was uh, a, start for a start for me. And yes. So is the main purpose of this to help the team to have a checklist that they do all the steps needed? Is that the main purpose? Or yes. Yeah. So the purpose of this program is, um, as you can see up here, is to provide needed tools for these um, individual things that happen during this ECMO process. So it starts with consultation. Uh, you have to write a, a report about the case, about the patients, then um, communication is a big part of it. So. Um, everybody in the team can use this tool, can read about the patient, can um, see what's, what is the schedule, get prepared. So yeah, when the, um, when the transport is starting, you have the checklists, yes. So that's the second part and you go through through them, you submit them to the program. You can look at it later. Um, and then you have these refill opportunities after the transportation to pack the equipment back and check everything and, and um, do the necessary upkeeping. But yeah, mostly it consists of uh, reporting, communicating, then checklisting, and and um, this is a demo of a live chat that they were not excited about, but they will be. Doctors don't communicate through web with each other at all in their work. So that's a big field that we need to introduce to them. A live conversation. But yeah, this is uh, what I've been up to here in Fraktio the last summer. It was not easy. Coding is not fun. <laughs> it's fun when it works, but yeah, I had a I, I am not going to be a coder, that's what I know. I will find some other task, but I will continue to learn coding. But fortunately, I can pay you guys, so that's a solution, <laughs> right? And you have to embrace the grinding, like sometimes yeah. slaps the grinding. Yeah, that's true, but that's the one thing. You people sitting here, you are the top coders in Finland, maybe in the world. So you just to you understand what's the beauty of the coding. If 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 sometimes you use in real life, if something something doesn't grow work, it's probably because of you or something else is broken. But when you are coding, it's always because of you. <laughs> yes, that's true. You, you, it's always that you are just too dumb to get it work. And that's why it's, 
it's constant learning. Yeah, it is. But you understand that, and uh, that's why I will pay you and not try to do it myself. I'll innovate your King code. But yeah, basically, there is a lot of stuff to be done. What has been the biggest eye opener so far with this? This project. Yeah. Uh, the fact that uh, most of the programs uh, and devices that we use, not devices, the programs that we use every day in hospitals, um, were designed and, and <laughs> executed by professionals that don't really know what we do or how we do it. So for me, the ultimate thing was to actually go with them and and do the work with them so that's the one thing i want to do in the future uh, in the it business to actually um, somehow try to incorporate these two things so that mainly i learned this from you guys here because you always taught me to start with why something has to be done like this and working like this. That was one of the big, biggest things I realized because if I, if I didn't go along with them, this would be very different looking and very working in different kind of different type. Oh yeah, this is a new feature. It's an oxygen index cal calculator that doesn't work. <laughs> Let's try it again. So yeah, basically what I want from this is when I present this to the team, I don't want to explain to them one thing. I want to give this to them and they should know what to do with it, what it's used for and how does it work. I'm not getting them a manual. That's the goal. What do you think, Henk? Henry? It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I'm, I'm just wondering, so after this all, you are, in the future, you are more interested about defining the problems in the medical field and solving them by yourself? Not by myself. Of course, but what I'm going to do when I grow up, I'm going to try to find and test solution between medical world and IT world and how to combine them in, in the most efficient way. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So basically, this is what I did all summer here. Thank you for that, Fraktio. It was a very great place to work. Thank you. You can check it out here, but don't, don't Please don't go to the source code, I beg you. <laughs> Somebody already did that and they were like, huh? It was you. Yeah. But, but in the end, there's two kinds of code. Those that work and is useful and those that doesn't work. It doesn't really matter how beautiful it is. Yeah, I know that. That's true. We, we in here we kind of tend to forget that that it, it's the code is not defined by that it's part by itself. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. So mm. don't be too harsh to yourself. When I'm looking my own thing that I have done like six months ago, I'm, I'm gonna puke. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's it, a because relief. Because it's constant learning. <laughs> it's always your fault. You got done that no, no good enough, but that's just true. Mm. 
But do you think that it's capable to produce some kind of a uh, network, for example, of IT teams that do what I did, for example, for each, uh, each division of hospitals, for example, surgery, how do they work, what kind of day is basically a work day in surgery department compared to neuro, for example. Is it possible for us to produce a lot of um, software, small software pieces that are designed to this individual uh, fields and then made to a bigger Maybe it's uh, about, since uh, the doctors aren't very familiar with IT, it seems, and not interested, but um, if coders can make something that makes their job easier, then someone like you who has uh, knowledge in both IT and medicine can uh, perhaps ask them what, what do they need and what would make their life easier, and then yes. kind of since you have a background also in programming, then you know what's possible to make and what's not. And uh, then... Uh, that's can... nice. I really don't know, but that's nice. <laughs> on, on, on the thing that uh, comes to my mind, why, why this whole, like, a, a more like a revolution on the medical field, on the programs, uh, the biggest problem with it is, is, is the responsibility that the, the hospitals and wh whoever is doing it, they want to have a guarantee that if something goes wrong, they don't get sued, and mm. if they get sued, they won't have to pay it, and that's why they tend want to buy their programs that cost millions mm. and from certain companies that can pay, pay the bills if some shit hits the fan. So, That's correct. Yeah, it, yes. it, it, it's not really a field that is uh, traditionally good for like uh, these uh, new innovations in, the, mm -hmm. in the, that that sense. So yeah, it, it's really complicated in that sense. It and is. I, I wish you luck if you go in there, but it, uh, for me it smells and like a den of snakes, so I wouldn't touch it. Well, thank you for that. But yeah, I've been doing uh, real time. I, I mean, coding for anesthesia monitor, and I was selling 15 years those yes. also. So they they were uh, like um, softwares that were CE marked. So so no one in Finland or in except we think you know, who is, is shoot by if they make a mistake and if the software is done by it it makes a mistake, but the. I think when the software is tested very well, so then, then mm. that's that's the testing is always the crucial thing. Yes. What you pass and what you don't pass, and then uh, when it's tested, so I think the biggest mistake is always a human being between. Yes, of course. It's, the, but the, the device. device and, uh, but what happened uh, last fall in Hus? All the systems were down. I mean, all of the systems were down, even phone, nothing worked, and it was a disaster, yes, but um, <coughs> does it have to be working program and not working pro program? Can, can't we um, develop a system between if, if, some, if the shit goes down, can we switch to something else? I don't know. Like Backbone, yeah. So in who's when when the all of the network stop working for a day, they were forced to use pen and paper and fax. So yeah, I know. Works. Yeah, can you imagine, uh, for example, a surgeon waiting, getting a call from other hospital, and like, okay, we have this kind of situation we think he needs the surgery can you look at the pictures and no I can't nothing's working so yeah I'm just it really is uh, dangerous if if your uh, software fails in this kind of environment but we have to 
we have to solve this problem. Yes, and uh, my point was that, that of course there is uh, testing and all related things, but uh, uh, the field is uh, maybe not so open-minded for new things because no. it's so regulated, oh. and that's that's a, that's no. a problem. That if you even if you had the like most brilliant idea ever, the software that saves every people ever, they would say no. Yes. Because we don't understand that thing and we don't trust it. And if you want to have a trust for them, you probably need to pay so much that it kind of kills mm. the innovation. Well, obviously not each and every one individual, but you're right. How did you know that? <laughs> that's that's so true. Yeah, but um, yeah. in a way, I, I think that uh, yeah, it's it's in a way true. But then when we add a public procurement also to that one, yes. so that, that especially in some of the countries where there's in Finland, for example, the biggest money in the healthcare is is our our money, our taxpayers' money. And, and then you have the public procurement. So, okay, if you have something new, I, I think piloting could be done more. But yes. when you go to the area of the patient, if it's something that, uh, for example, uh, supports you in the decision, so then you go to the CE mark and the ISO 13485 that needs to be also certified as a mm. medical device. But as long as it's lists like this that you use it instead of uh, your head or paper tick mark, it, then it's okay. And piloting some things, but mm. the closer you go to the supporting the help or, or keeping up the life of a patient, so then it's then it gets complicated. Yes, what do you say, honestly? As a head of cardiothoracic uh, ward. So yeah, basically it's a pile of um, questions and and problems to be solved and uh, people who maybe don't understand each other, engineers, healthcare professionals. Yeah, it's fun. I can't wait for. Jumping in. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's eat something.